So I thought I'd make it interesting by telling you a wee bit about uh, my start, more, more or less start in life, uh, somewhat impoverished circumstances, then talk about a couple of uh, glorious failures. And then in thinking about today, I also thought, what are some of the phrases that I've heard most often in, in my business life? So if you come with me on a journey, and I'll explain what I mean by those three things, uh, early upbringing, uh, a couple of amazing or glorious failures, and then what, are, what is this common phrase that has come up so often? First of all, I should say that I feel very welcome here because my wife was born in Christchurch, and I had a great time at Canterbury University here at the engineering school. Uh, graduating in light current engineering. So uh, I feel very welcome, very much at home in Christchurch. I was born in Petone, and when I was born, my father was 60, and my mother was 25. Now, a lot of people say, wow, I love his DNA. So, um, but that led to uh, a bit of a problem, in a way, because when I was quite young, I came home from school one day and found my father dead. And so uh, very, very early on, I learned a lot about independence and the need for self-reliance. And in a way, I, that's been fortunate, or I've been able to draw on, on that resource in later years. Uh, the first uh, grand failure was at around about age 13, uh, when other kids were experimenting with contact explosives and with gunpowder. I thought, uh, that seems to be fairly commonplace. I wonder what I could do uh, to match that or even better it. I was reading one day a magazine, Popular Mechanics. And in this Popular Mechanics magazine, there was a line diagram of the atomic bomb. And I thought, now that would be cool. And you could very clearly construct an atomic bomb from uh, a line drawing in Popular Mechanics magazine. So I went to the local pharmacist in Petone, and this was a pharmacist who uh, was quite willing to sell young kids uh, phosphorus, sodium, uh, acids, um, chemical acids. Um, and so I went to him and said, I showed him this diagram, and I said that I wanted to build an atomic bomb. And did he have any of the stuff called uranium? And he looked at it and said, uh, no, he was out of stock of uranium, but uh, he bought out what was the, a periodic table. And notice he didn't say, you can't build an atomic bomb. His attitude was, look, here's the periodic table. Here's where uranium is here at 235. But uh, we haven't got any uranium, but look, just above uranium at 82, there's lead. It's not very far away. <laughs> so what about if you tried lead and you might just get a little explosion? I said, well, that's a good idea. So for several weeks, I collected as many lead head nails as I could get hold of, stripped lead of old roofing iron or flashing, and got uh, melted it down with a blowtorch and got a piece about uh, a ball about the size of a tennis ball. I cut it in half, put some caps from a cap gun in between, got a piece of old steam pipe and loaded these two balls and the uh, gunpowder from the cap in between, plugged the end with wood and this was going to produce a bang bigger than any of the other kids in the neighbourhood could do with, with gunpowder. Now, I was a smart 13-year-old because I thought, how can I set this off? If I wallop it with a hammer and it goes off, no one will be around to know that it, uh, what happened. So I thought the best thing to do is to try and remotely detonate it. And I came up with the idea of going up on the roof, the gable of the house where we lived in Petone, and dropping it onto the concrete path. So if it went off, I would be protected. Uh, you can imagine after two weeks that nothing happened except chips in the concrete path. So I went back to the pharmacist and said, look, it's not going off. And he said, well, something must be wrong. And he said, look, I'll tell you what, though. Um, maybe you're not cut out to be a nuclear physicist. But have you thought of electronics? 
And I said, no, what does he mean? And he said, look, I'll show you how to build a crystal set. So he gave me some wire and a pair of old phones and showed me how to wind a coil, gave me some components for a crystal set, and how to make a detector out of a piece of coal and a razor blade. And I'll never forget the thrill of making this little crystal set with a piece of coal and a razor blade, putting on those headphones and hearing music. Now, granted, six stations were coming in all at once, but that didn't matter. <laughs> it was the thrill of hearing uh, a detector that I'd made and to see how this could work. And so that pharmacist then, by means of that support, saying, not, you can't do that, but by saying, look over there, uh, and that set me off on an elect electronics uh, career. So uh, there was a, a glorious failure, that of not having uh, an explosion and wiping out Batoni, uh, and to have a supportive local pharmacist set me off on electronics career. I was quite lucky in that I, I was ducks of the local high school and then got accelerated uh, entry to Victoria University to do engineering intermediate. Uh, I was 17 at the time, I had no brothers or sisters, so appearing at university at that age uh, was um, quite a remarkable experience. I uh, discovered alcohol and I made the New Zealand University's judo team and also I discovered girls. And you can imagine what happened another glorious failure. I failed everything in that first year of engineering intermediate. And at that time I had a public service scholarship and I remember the manager of the scholarship saying, sorry Neville, you're not going to make it, you need to be a radio technician. So I did then a certificate in engineering and decided to apply myself. I then got accelerated entry to here to engineering school at Canterbury University. So, and found that the, uh, the reasons for my failure may be a bit of a legend here, for, at least for the first few weeks. So there was another failure, uh, and uh, after two of those glorious failures, I figured I'd had enough. And so I then, uh, after graduation here, uh, went to work for what was civil aviation. I was able to come back here uh, to do a master's. Uh, the government refused leave. Uh, I got sent to the Cook Islands instead. Uh, then I got a scholarship to go to the Imperial College. They refused leave for that too. They said, you can't do that. We want you to work. And so this will be a familiar theme to some here. After about three years, my student bond had come down and my salary was going up. The area under the curve became equal and I was able to pay off the bond and say to my boss, you told me I couldn't do this, but here's my resignation. And I had a rotary scholarship at that time and went off to the US. So there was someone who's saying, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. Finally, it led to uh, resignation. I went to the US and fetched up in the Apollo Mission Control Center. So, uh, and saw there, this was at the time of Apollo 13. A lot of young people were there uh, under huge stress getting Apollo 13 back. Uh, but at the same time, they were having a lot of fun, and I said at that time to myself, I need to be much more immersed in science and technology. It's one of those moments that, for example, you, a lot of people who stand in the shower and all things become clear to you. It was looking uh, at those younger uh, people and the emission control center was a big switch for me. So I've got Rotary to thank for being able to turn on that switch. So when I came uh, back, I joined IBM. And after about four years there, uh, I thought I need my own company. I said to my then boss that I was going to start my own company. He said, you can't do that. That will never work. Look, you've got a marvelous career here with IBM. IBM is taking over the world. I said, yeah, maybe, but uh, I would like my own company. He said, it'll never work. So on a Friday, I resigned from IBM, and on a Monday, I cleaned out a spare bedroom in my mother's home that was in Batoni and started uh, what was to become mass technology, doing uh, mostly in those early days 
defence electronics. And the neighbour said to my mother, what on earth is Neville doing? Why doesn't he get a job? He seems to be working all hours of the day and night, uh, and you know, he should be uh, doing something useful. Uh, it'll, it'll, it'll never work. However, uh, it did work, and the company went on to uh, list on the main board of the NASDAQ in the US. Uh, in the mid-90s, we employed about 250 staff. The turnover uh, was well over 100 million a year. And uh, at that point, after the listing, a bigger US company said, why don't we amalgamate? And if you amalgamate, we'll stay, both stay on the, uh, the stock exchange. So I thought well, that was a good idea. And it's interesting that the Securities Exchange Commission in the US said, OK, and within 30 days, they had approved a transaction. A transaction for a US company to amalgamate with a New Zealand company and be listed on a US exchange. Officials in New Zealand said, you can't do that. No one's done that before. Uh, you know, this, this won't work. The, the legislation doesn't cover it. So I thought, well, uh, but they said, look, we'll get back to you. So we went ahead and did it anyway, and the officials never get, did get back. Uh, I think they lost my phone number. Uh, so it was a very successful amalgamation coming from, you can't do that. So after a couple of years after the amalgamation, I decided uh, that since there were quite a few embryonic science and technology companies developing in New Zealand, I would get into venture capital. This was uh, 1998, when there was no uh, infrastructure at all for venture capital. So with my own cash, I formed a fund which went rather well, and then another fund in 2002, 2003. And then, uh, just at the end of the GFC, I uh, thought we should have a third fund and took the step of talking to investors about what uh, kind of fund they might want. And they were saying, we want to see a listed company, uh, we want some liquidity, we want to, to have more visibility uh, of investments, we do not want to be paying annual management fees, and we want a more global perspective. So I went to the NZX uh, here and to some of the brokers and, and talked about what the demands from the investors were. And they said, well, we don't care. That'll never work. You can't do it. Uh, it won't work in New Zealand. Just at that time, there were some people looking at small countries, other small countries, uh, other small countries like Singapore, Israel, Ireland. They left out Scotland, I don't know why, uh, and Denmark. And everyone was benchmarking and talking about these small countries, but actually no one was doing anything. So I, th I thought it would be based on the experience of calling the NASDAQ stock exchange. I thought, I wonder what would happen if someone did a listing on one of these small country exchanges. So in other words, we're not just benchmarking, we're not just talking uh, to institutions in these countries. But here's a way of getting totally enmeshed in the country itself. So I chose Denmark, and I called the Danish Stock Exchange and said what we wanted to do. And they said, sure, that's a really good idea. We'd love to have a listed investment company. So this was about uh, 18 months ago, and bear in mind, everyone in New Zealand is saying you can't do it. And here's Denmark saying we would love to have an investment company. So in about a month's time, we will have a listed investment company operating on a Danish exchange, which happens to be centred in London. And people around here, sorry, not here, but in New Zealand said you can't do it, it won't work. So what does all this mean? I thought that uh, I'd give you a few statistics because it's interesting uh, when you've lived a few summers to go back and do a longitudinal evaluation of, of what has happened. So as David said before, uh, mass technology and the successes uh, is still uh, growing very well in Wellington. 
the uh, earnings from that company and the successes is well over a billion dollars of di uh, direct net exchange coming into New Zealand. And this is very high margin stuff. And the people, of course, in those companies are very well paid, so there's quite a big tax take as well. And with Endeavour Capital, then many millions, or many tens of millions of dollars have been raised offshore as well to bring into New Zealand and apply it to New Zealand, mainly science and technology companies. And now, with uh, being able to list offshore, another problem, in my view, is getting solved. Hitherto, people have been going offshore trying to get investment for individual New Zealand companies, which generally tend to be quite small and not of great interest to offshore investors. So then uh, people here are trying to aggregate New Zealand companies, but still go offshore to individual investors. So I think it's time now, and this is what we're tr uh, trying, is to take the brand Endeavour offshore uh, and use that as the aggregating point for investment to come back to New Zealand. Because offshore investors understand the rules and the regulations of their own stock markets in the UK, for example, in Asia, where they don't totally understand those in New Zealand. So here's a way now of doing what I call a micro, micro, micro virgin. So the brand can be taken offshore to be an attractor for funding to bring back. So that's what we're now doing. We have uh, the listed company coming up in Europe, and we have an Endeavour company also in Asia attracting funds likewise. So one of the benchmarks that I mentioned about was the amount of uh, net revenue that can come into New Zealand from uh, Endeavour, little e Endeavour. The other thing which is important is this, that mass technology started from very, very humble circumstances. In fact, the capital was $2,000, of which the accountants and the lawyers took most. However, uh, and it was dramatically undercapitalized. But from that, quite a large company grew and more than that, uh, there are now three generations of uh, engineers, of developers, of software programmers, of managers that have come from that very, very small beginning. So when we did the uh, IPO, uh, and by the way, I had given 40% of the uh, company to everyone in the company, to all the staff. And so we made 10 multi-millionaires overnight after the listing. Over time, they left and set up their own companies. So that was the second generation. And now there are people leaving those companies and setting up their own companies. Now the third generation. And if you total up the total value of those companies, it is many hundreds of millions of dollars. And this is the kind, I'm not saying this is unique, but it's the kind of thing that we need to replicate and need to understand that once you get the second and third generation of young entrepreneurs coming through and doing their own thing, then we can really get the economy going in that particular area. So that's what I wanted to say that came out of those uh, uh, somewhat humble beginnings, uh, two amazing failures early on that uh, gave me a real kick in the behind, and I made sure that I wouldn't have failure after that. And then that single phrase that keeps on coming through, you can't do that, it won't work. What I would exhort everyone, particularly the young people here, to take note of is that if you use that phrase almost in the, the judo way of uh, using the opposing force and making use of it. And so when you hear that, it won't work, you can't do it, you say, damn it, let's get in and do it. Usually it will work out, and usually it'll be pretty damn good. David.